It's Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. in Switzerland. It's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk 33 minutes with Timidayo Onyo Shung will begin soon. Thanks for joining us for our talk today about global space budgets, um, country level analysis. But don't worry, that will be not an accounting lesson today. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. That is very valuable for us and will help us to improve. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. If you like more about us and our goals, listen to the last episode of our podcast. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to where you can support us actively and become a space watcher. The edition one has cool items for you, your friends and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive and we do that for you. If you miss any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the events section and on YouTube. We host our Space Cafe web talks live weekly. My guest today is a great young man with a great vision for space. Welcome, Timidayu Onyo Shung. I tried it again, and I hope this time the pronunciation was a bit better than the first one. Timidayu is the managing director for Space in Africa, an analytics and consulting company focusing on the African space and satellite industry. He leads all company operations, including the consulting services to governments and commercial companies in the African space industry value chain. Timidayu is a Kalman Fellow, a 2020 Kalman Fellow, not on the cur uh, cur current uh, a uh, course um, so last year and has a master degree in satellite applications from the University of Strathclyde in the UK. Right now he is working on his PhD in the US. Timidayu, happy to have you here with us today. Let's kick that off. About six weeks ago, you published your report about global space budgets and congrats for that. Um, before we are getting into the details, let's talk about what you measured, what is your definition of a space budget? I think that's absolutely important to set this baseline here. Thank you very much, Dustin, for having me today. Uh, great show. Uh, to answer your question, our, uh, our report focus on global space budget. Um, so this is the amount of money that a country dedicates for its space program. Um, it is not the amount of money they spend, so budget, not expenditure. Uh, and this is one of the things that we explained in the methodology of the report. Uh, so for, for some countries, at the beginning of the year, they come and pass a budget for the year to say, this is how much money we're spending on you know, different mm -hmm. programs. And um, you know, for countries like the US, um, you know, like the UK, Nigeria, and how they've got specific amount of money that they're spending on this space program. So these are the figures that we presented. Um, now, it does not mean, in some cases, uh, people, get, people think that, you know, budget is like what they're spending on the space agency. So it's not just the money they're spending on the space agency, because for some um, countries, they've got more space institutions. It's not just like the space agency. Some, um, you know, some have like maybe defense space agency, uh, you know, and things like that, and other space research institutions. So it's the combination of like all of these figures. Um, so take Nigeria, for example. They've got a space agency. They've got um, a national communication satellite limited. They've got. Uh, a defense space agency. They've even got like, you know, um, a center for space propulsion and all of that. So for a country like that, we combine all of these figures together, um, you know, to present what their space budget is for the year. 
Got you, got you. I mean, when you came out uh, with the report, you promoted it as an first of its kind. So, and that was a bit confusing for many of us because there were reports about space budget out already. So what is the different of all the other reports that we have seen over over time, I mean, over the last decades? Um, first of all, this is an open source report. So this is a different thing compared to like other reports, uh, you know, you've seen on global space budgets. Um, this is an open source report, and this is also a report where we actually described our methodologies and we made it clear for people because global space budget is really a complicated figure, uh, a complicated subject. It's like discussing the global space industry valuation. You know, oftentimes you see a chart that just shows like the breakdown, but uh, understanding the methodology behind those things are very important. So. Our reports, uh, you know, is, is a free report, like an open source report. Um, and also in the report, we, you know, introduce what we call transparency index. So the goal of this is to explain to, um, you know, people, you know, what the transparency level is in all of these countries. Because it's obviously not all the countries that have specific space budgets. So the way you retrieve space budgets for, say the US is different from the way you retrieve it for China, it's different from the way you retrieve it for the UAE because they've got like different system of government, they've got, um, you know, they, they, they are at a different level with openness regarding the government data. So we introduced the transparency index to explain, it, uh, to show, you know, the level of openness uh, of all of these countries regarding their budget. <laughs> Transparency is absolute and a very interesting parameter, and I think it's not too often used in it in this context. So, can you give us some more insight in how you measure it then actually, and about the methodology? I mean, have you sent really people to all the countries, or did you went to the internet and just went through the documents of the government? In I mean, usually, obviously, or obviously in all these various languages that, that the countries provide. So to, how was it that's done, this collection of data? Great question. Um, so the methodology we use uh, to retrieve the data, we, you know, um, we analyze various government uh, data. So this includes like maybe data retrieved from websites or government documents. So these are documents either published by the space agency or by the ministry that oversees the space agency or by, you know, like the budget office of a country. Um, you know, we also interviewed, uh, you know, some top officials in some of these countries. Um, and then we also did some archival research. Um, regarding transparency, we, you know, divided this into three. So, there are countries that, you know, that are extremely open with the budget. So countries like the US, countries like South Africa, countries like, uh, you know, Germany, like Nigeria. So these countries, you can, you know, obtain information on what they're spending on the space program from their government documents. So either, um, you know, either you go on like, you know, their agency websites, you know, you can see like government official documents um, or maybe it, you know, the entire like budget for the country. So you can see, oh, this is how much is going to this institution and all of that. So there are countries like that. Um, there are countries that are not as open as that. And, you know, for them, um, you know, when you talk to top officials, they give you information. So um, I'm not going to mention specific countries like this, but uh, if you go through the report, you can see like a breakdown of it. So there are countries where, you know, their report is, you know, uh, their budget is reported by a third party. So by third party, it means you're not seeing that on the government official document, but you are able to retrieve in this information from maybe interacting with a top government official or maybe a third party website, you know, had already published an information. Take, for example, uh, you know, Space Watch Global would have an interview with 
uh, say someone from Sweden, uh, say Sweden has a space agency, and you know, a top official from Swedish space agency, and maybe one of the questions you're asking is, oh, how much is the government budgeting for this? And the person gives this figure. Now, that figure is less trustworthy compared to if it is from a government official. Uh, because the person who could inflate the figure, the person who produced the figure, you never can tell. Uh, so these are countries that are in the second category. Also, some countries in the second categories are, you know, countries where there's like some sort of language barrier and there's like issues with, um, you know, conversion. So, you know, take China, for example, there has been like, you know, several, you know, conversations around oh, how much is China actually spending on space budget. Um, a lot of publications around these are like English-based publications. Um, and, you know, sometimes the figures have been produced, sometimes like some sort of inflation in it. Uh, also in converting some of these figures that are also like, you know, some sort of transparency lost. So, um, you know, this is some of the challenges that you know that we face and these are some of the issues that we reported um in in our transparency and then the top category are countries that you know you don't know um you know there's no information from an official government website um there's no information from like a top official uh but you have estimates from um you have estimates from like how much money they're actually spending so you know, whether you're estimating that from how much their satellites cost or from you're estimating that from or on the size of their space agency or the space institution or the kind of projects that they're doing. So, you know, this is like the last category. And, you know, so this is like how we broke this down. And uh, that's why the transparency in this is extremely important. Okay. Understood. So how many countries are, did you analyze and then finally are i mean how many countries did you identify also with serious space ambitions i mean we have at the moment i think in un copius almost 100 countries are as far as i'm aware of uh, so we have 80 countries with uh, space agencies or yeah, articulated space ambitions. So what are the numbers you came came up with? Thank you very much for that question. Um, so we analyzed 106 countries altogether. And from these 106 countries, um, your question about, you know, countries that have, I don't know, did you say large space program? It, it depends mm -hmm. on how you define large space. So um, take, for example, in a continent like Africa, a, you know, you can count, uh, you know, maybe a country like Gabon, whose budget is around $1 million to $1.4 million annual budget. You know, that's a space program, but, you know, it's nothing compared to like countries that are spending billions. So, um, but altogether there are, you know, at least 50 countries with like, you know, um, good level of development. Um, I know, you know, some other reports have reported uh, about 70 to, you know, 80, 85 countries, you know, having some sort of space program. But uh, based on our reports, you know, we have like 106 countries. Now, of course, the level of space program in most of these countries, you know, vary. Uh, some have been able to launch satellites, some have not been able to launch satellites. Some actually have space agencies. Some are running their space program through, you know, like a university or like a research institution. So it is like in a lot of variation. Got it. Got it. I mean, let's take a concrete example. How did you split or collect these national budgets? I mean, for instance, versus here in, in Europe. The national budget versus is the ESA budget or versus the space defense budget, as you said before. So did you really put all it together and then try, try to split it? So how that, does the mechanics worked for you? 
Yes, so um, one of the things that you know we did with this report is we tried to avoid duplication of figures. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take ESA, uh, so in Europe, you know, some countries are part of the EU space program, you know, the Copernicus and the likes, you know, there's also ESA, there is also UMET, you know, there's like different organizations that countries, you know, contribute to. And there are some countries that actually contribute to these organizations, but they actually don't have like a national space program. Yeah. Um, there are countries that, you know, their national space budget is split between their national space program and the amount of money they're contributing to this third party organization. You know, take countries like France, like Germany, and these are, you know, also some of like the largest contributors to, you know, whether it is ESA or EMETA and the like. So, what we did is we separated this. So take um, take a country like Germany, for example. Germany contributes to a lot of these third party organizations. So, well, if Germany is coming out to say, oh, this is how much we're spending on space this year, they usually like, you know, combine the money for DLR. Uh, so that's their, you know, national space agency. They combine that with how much money they're giving to EMETA, to, you know, ESA and, you know, and the likes. So what we did is to actually remove this. We separated it. So if, if take for example, uh, your budget is $2 billion and out of $2 billion, 1.5 is going to like all these stock price organization and you've got five, uh, you know, $500 million. Now we're going to report that your national budget is $2 billion. But um, when we're doing the, uh, you know, accumulation of all the figures. We're not going to have ESA budget with that again. So ESA budget is except ESA and all these third party organizations' budget is separated from like what the countries are actually spending, um, you know, on the national space program. Yeah. Um, and this is extremely important because, uh, you know, there has also been conversations around duplication of figures in the industry, even with like, you know, global space industry valuation. When you look at, you know, um, other segments that are, you know, analyzed, you see that there are like, you know, so many duplications and sometimes this affects the figures that are reported. It either like, you know, shoot it up or like bring it down, but, you know, it affects it. So this is the, um, so this is one of the things that we took into consideration. In addition, um, there are also countries that have, um, am I going to explain it? So there are countries that their national space budget is actually different from, you know, how much they spend on capital projects. So um, these are countries that, you know, so take, for example, a country like Egypt would come and say, oh, our national space budget for this year is $40 million. But in the same year, they're spending like $700 million on, you know, satellite projects. Obviously, the $700 million did come from the party. So, you know, there is also this variation. There are several countries like that, that you know, the national space budget is different from how much money they're spending on capital projects. Usually, these capital projects are in form of, uh, you know, communication satellite, uh, sometimes earth observation satellite and like. So there are countries that the national space budget is for, you know, general operations and maybe development of, you know, small scale project like CubeSat and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then you've got countries that their budget is everything they're spending. So whether they're doing human space flight program or they're developing satellite or they're developing rockets and all, everything is combined into that. So this is um, also one of the things that we are explaining our methodology. Okay, great. It sounds complicated, but let's, to talk about some really numbers. I mean, can you give us an overview about the numbers and how the numbers developed over the years? Uh, so from the last report to uh, now, or from the last assessment to 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 this uh, to this year, what you have in mind? Was there an effect of the pandemic? I mean, we had it as one of the uh, question in in our um, invitation here. So did you see uh, an effect of the pandemic and? 
more important for me is, so before we going into Africa, so how do you see emerging countries in Latin America, in Caribbean, in Asia, perform or increase their, their, their budgets? Uh, thank you very much. So let me let me do like some sort of continental breakdown, uh, mm -hmm. you know, starting from Africa. So in 2018, Africa's space budget was about $283 million. In 2019, it rose to $325 million. That's, you know, a reasonable increase. But in 2020, it rose to over $500 million. Now, the reason for this is because now, aside from the fact that some countries, um, you know, are increasing their space budget, more countries are also developing space programs. So, if you, um, you know, in a continent where you know five countries have space program, by the time the number increases to like, you know, ten countries, fifteen countries, obviously the budget is going to keep going up. So, this is, you know, what we're seeing in Africa. Um, in Asia, in 2018, the budget was you know, about $13.1 billion. Uh, in 2019, it rose to like $15.8 billion. In 2020, it reduced to like, you know, $15.4 billion. So, you know, this is as a result of, you know, countries like China, like India, like South Korea, um, you know, that are like, you know, with very reasonable, you know, national policies. Now, the variation is not, you know, so much because, um, you know, so for some of these continents, sometimes the budget go up, sometimes it comes down. Now, one of the reasons for this is that there are priorities, like priorities changes. So um, in 2019, for example, you could have a priority of, you know, you know, having more investment for like a human space flight mission. Uh, but then in 2020, you don't have that priority. So, you know, that chunk of the budget is gone. Now you just like need to, you know, manage stuff and operate satellites and things like that. In Europe, the budget in 2018 was about $17 billion. Uh, in 2019, it's reduced to like $15 billion. And in 2020, it went back up, you know, to, to about $17.1 billion. Um, and in Latin America and the Caribbean, it was, you know, it has been fluctuating between 164 and, you know, 157. Uh, million dollars. Also in, in Latin American and the Caribbean, more countries are also developing space programs. It's similar to what is going on in Africa. Um, in North America, it has been between 41 to like 38 billion dollars. So the variation in this is mostly as a result of the U.S. space budget. Uh, you know, the fluctuation is it's driven by the U.S. Um, in Oceania in 2018, it was like $226 million. In 2019, it dropped like $30 million. And, you know, why do you have something like that? Because, you know, in 2018, you know, there was like a big project, you know, establishment of an agency, you know, that sort of like, you know, project, you know, it brings like a lot of investment at once. And then you have like this huge amount of money being spent on space program. And then, in the following year, you obviously don't need like, you know, to replicate that. So it comes up. Now, the interesting thing is that in, uh, so looking at the continent, in 2018, Africa's contribution to global space budget was about 0.39%. Uh, and in 2020, it has risen to 0.70%. So that's almost, you know, 50% increase in like three um in three years and you know this is going to keep increasing because more countries in africa are developing space program uh the ones that already have space programs they are also you know embarking on more ambitious projects uh so this contribution is you know this this budget is going to keep increasing um and it would also uh increase with respect to like the global space budget um africa is the uh, is the fastest growing, uh, you know, continent with regards to space budget that we've seen. Um, you know, a continent like, you know, in Latin America and the Caribbean in 2018, the contribution was, you know, about 0.23%. And in 2020, it was just, you know, around 0.22%. So, you know, it wasn't much. Um, if you look at Oceania in 
2018, it was 0.31% in 2020. It had reduced to 0.02%. Um, so, you know, this is what is going on. The, the other thing is that for, uh, for some countries, um, especially if you look at uh, in, in Oceania, so the goal is also moving from like, you know, government-centric space programs, like, you know, commercially driven space programs. Yeah. So yeah. now countries are saying that, you know, it's not, um, you know, the, the goal shouldn't be about, you know, developing like national satellites or like developing, you know, human space flight program, space exploration program, developing national rockets mm -hmm. and things like that. The goal is now shifting towards, oh, you know what, how do we, develop policies and attract private companies to come and operate on our side. So if you're seeing like that kind of shift is also, you know, affecting budget, you know, because now governments can spend less, create an enabling environment for, pri for private sector to thrive, and, you know, everybody wins. Absolutely. I mean, you, you touched on Africa already and you guys are with space in Africa, um, absolute insider or onto the African continent space activities in in its entire um, dimension. So, what do you see there? I mean, you alluded a bit uh, on the on the shift to to more the commercial, but what can we expect from Africa in the next five years? Um, so, in the next five years, uh, you know, African countries are developing more satellites. Um, and you know more investment more countries developing space for. so take for example there are you know 43 satellites have been launched up to date by 2024 uh, that number is going to rise to over 120 you know so that's like you know about 80 satellites in the next three years. you know more than you know um times two of like what has been launched in the past 20 years. so um, you know, more satellite projects, more countries are also developing space for So currently there are 11 countries that have launched at least one satellite space. In the next three years, that number is gonna rise to over 20 countries. Um, so, and then with more countries, uh, you know, more satellites, um, you know, that's like more investment in space program. And then with the African Union driven, uh, you know, African Space Agency, this is, you know, bringing more interest into Africa and, um, you know, we're going to be seeing like more projects and, and things like that. So generally the African space industry uh, is experiencing, you know, very good growth. It's uh, a lot of um, private companies are now seeing it as a good destination for space business, uh, you know, because of the various, you know, opportunities and like the different segments of the industry, whether it is, in satellite technology development, whether it is in capacity development or in launch services or, you know, um, in communication services uh, and all of that. So this is what we're seeing in Africa and we, uh, we expect this to, you know, keep growing. And, you know, based on our work on the global space budget, it's a bit similar to what we're seeing in other emerging regions uh, like in Latin America and the Caribbean um, and some part of Asia. I mean, we had the chance in our podcast to talk to Lynn Kaiser uh, a few months ago, or a month ago, actually. And um, his, the story he tells from his family um, rooted back to Africa, where we have seen in the 70s the Otrak, the German Otrak uh, company, launching their rockets from the jungle of Sing Zaire at that point of time. So. Do you see development of space ports in, in Africa, particularly? Uh, I mean, well, well located on the, uh, on the uh, equator. Um, so is it something, I mean, what is in development? Um, yeah, we're already seeing this. Uh, I mean, was it last year or like two years ago? You know, it's, I think it was last year. Italy, you know, signed a new agreement with Kenya uh, you know, to resume the use of the space spot in, um, in Kenya. So, you know, um, you know, that's something. And then also, I think in February, there was um, an announcement by the Turkish president to invest uh, another $1 billion into like a moon mission for, for Turkey. And, 
you know, they've chosen Somalia as a destination to be the space spot. So, yes, you know, this is an example of the kind of um, opportunities that are in Africa, you know, you know, a business opportunities in like the space industry that are in Africa. You know, there is opportunity. There are so many countries in Africa that are on the equator and that that are very open to you know collaborating with um, other regions, whether it's private companies or government institutions. Um, you know, to develop you know this kind of um, um, you know this kind of infrastructure, or to even resume the use of existing. I mean, uh, if you look at countries like Algeria, countries like South Africa, you know, in the past they used to launch a rocket from all of these places. Yeah. Um, but then, because rocket launch is not exactly a priority for a lot of African countries, um, so it sort of like open up an opportunity for foreign institutions to come into the continent to work with uh, these different countries. There is, there's also always benefits from both sides. You know, you can benefit from launching your satellites or whatever from, you know, the equator in these countries and, you know, maybe through capacity development or, um, or something or investment, you know, the, the host countries also benefit from that. So, um, you know, the benefits yeah. is, in both direction, and I think this is uh, this is one of the good opportunities that continent offers. Got it. So, when before coming to the questions, so when doing the the uh, reports or the analytics, so what did you surprised most are in this in this process? Um, well, first of all, it was surprising to see so many countries with some sort of space program. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, you know, previous reports have always been reporting, um, you know, um, countries with space programs to be around 70, 85 and the like. So it was interesting to see over 100 countries across the world developing some sort of space program. Um, that was surprising and interesting. Um, it was also kind of like interesting to see the growth in you know some of these emerging regions, uh, so whether it is Latin America and the Caribbean, or in um, in Asia or in Africa, it's it's very interesting to see like you know what the growth is, um, and how many countries are actually seeing space technologies as you know an important um, you know element for their economic growth and development. So that was also um, you know interesting. And it was um, it was also interesting to see the kind of project that some of these countries are embarking on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whether it is communication satellites or you know. And then there is also like this policy growth, uh, you know, some countries that you actually never thought have you know, some sort of space policy. Uh, you realize that, and you know, there's now a shift in countries trying to develop policy first before actually embarking on space project, which was like, you know, the opposite in the past where, you know, countries just develop satellite without a plan. Uh, but now countries are like, you know, prioritizing developing policy. So this is a guideline for our space program and then they implement projects, you know, alongside us. So that's also very interesting. Great. We have one question uh, from Mikhail um, asking you about the space market in Botswana, especially. Or, um, what about their first project of developing their first CubeSat? Are you having some insights on that? Uh, yes. So the Botswana government recently announced uh, a space program. They want to develop a space program. Um, estimating the space market. Uh, so this depends on what you mean by space market. Do you mean the valuation of you know, the space industry in Botswana? Uh, if that's what you're looking at, um, you know, that's like beyond you know, talking about budgets because with valuation, you have to you know, like look at the different segments. Are you looking at you know, the SATCOM market and opportunities in Botswana? Are you looking at the earth observation potentials? You know, different things. Uh, there are a lot of factors that, you know, um, that come into estimating space market. If you're talking specifically on the budget, um, when the announcement was made by the president and all, an actual figure was not allocated for this. Um, so we are expecting that before the end of the year, 
or you know like next year like um, so when the government is developing budget for like the next fiscal year um an exact budget will go into this but you know for Botswana it's also complicated and this is also one of the um things that we explain in the methodology so it's not all countries that actually have a space agency that a budget is tied to so Botswana does not have a space agency Botswana's first satellite project which is a CubeSat which um, you know, it's estimated to cost between 50000 to like $500,000. Uh, that project is domiciled at a university. So it's been implemented in a university with collaborations with foreign partners. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, this is one of the things that we also saw in like, you know, when we were working on this, because some countries have like space agencies uh, and institutions that budget is tied to. Some have like research institutions, some have like, um, you know, university-based program. Um, and I, I think Mikhail are um, tr try to uh, or, um, verify his question, but as you said, that was not part of the um, of the of the um, of the study. But I'm quite sure that you guys are open to have in our discussion with Mikhail and his company about some further uh, consulting and, and studies in, in the market as we int introduced our space in Africa as a consulting company. And what does a consulting company do? Consulting others. So um, with that, I'm coming to my last question. So, and I'm, I like asking all my very well informed guests like you. So how do you see our human future in space? I mean, I, I know it's a very broad question with all the respect, so, but just want to have your, your inspiring thoughts on that. Um, good question. I mean, I think we've, um, everything now is about capitalism. So uh, everything now is about business. And I think this segment of the industry will keep growing. Um, we more companies developing business models around this. Um, I mean, look at what Axiom Space is doing, you know. So that, those kind of interesting business models, we obviously like Roger's uh, segment of the industry. It's kind of like interesting to see, um, you know, human space flight more driven by, you know, commercial and rather than like, you know, government sending astronauts to space. Um, you know, I think the market is very wild and I think it, it's going to keep growing. Um, you know, I mean, there's so many countries that still don't have astronauts and they are all probably dreaming of having astronauts in the future. So, you know, that's a huge market. Um, and there's like so many billionaires that are also fascinated about, oh yeah, I want to go to space. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is an interesting segment of the industry. Uh, I think there is a lot of room for more players, like more commercial companies to play in this space. Because uh, I think the opportunity like, are immense. I, I also think it's important for us to, you know, the more we're able to bring down the cost, the more people we're able to, you know, send to space. And, you know, hopefully, you know, time is going to come in the next you know, 20, 30, 50 years where, you know, going to space would be like me flying from Lagos to San Francisco. Got it. Got it. I'm afraid uh, we have to come to an end. Even so, I would like to continue our uh, inspiring talk. Um, be assured we will continue also our, to following space budgets and this entire discussion around that in the future Space Cafe web talks and in our magazine. So, um, and as you spoke about astronauts, um, this week, so in two days, we will have the chance in Germany with the Space Cafe Germany to talk uh, with Thomas Reiter, an actual astronaut uh, who was on the ISS. Uh, he was also on Mir, uh, and he is about to retire from ESA. So uh, we are very well looking forward to that. That will happen on Thursday, but in German language to our, just to inform all of you. On the 7th, on Friday, we will have our, the first edition of our Space Cafe Canada by uh, Dr. Jessica West. And her first guest will be Dr. David Kendall from the Outer Space Institute. And that's really an, um, a space cafe, a new space cafe I'm looking forward 
to hear it, or it will be at 6 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Next week, I will talk or in my 33 minutes with uh, Laura or Forsyk or about the human, as uh, a commercial human space flight. So um, we are picking up on that. And a week later with Catherine Courtney about STEM and education and sustainability. In this week, uh, we also start our first Space Cafe UK with Ian Jones as our first guest of Goon Hilly Earth Stations. And then, as a special announcement, I have the chance after Pentecost on the 25th of uh, May to talk with uh, Will Marshall, the CEO of Planet, about the European Green Deal. That will be a very exciting talk, at least for me, I have to say. And two days later, our next edition of the Space Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland will follow. Um, his guest will be, or our guest will be, Jenny Tapio and Alexander Suchek from ESA. Um, very cool event as well. All events are online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback, so please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher today. Your support will help us. Take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. I know, but we need your support to keep our work alive. Thank you very much for your interest today. And thank you very much, Temidayu, for your inspiring talk and being my guest. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job week by week again. I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us and I hope to see you next week or tomorrow or on Friday. In the meantime, visit our website, follow us on social media and hope to see a few of you on Clubhouse in a moment. So don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much and all the best. <laughs>